Hello everybody, and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 263. This week the questions are taken from guides 322 and 323, that's USS Maine of 1889, the cruiser-battleship that exploded and sank in Cuba, and the MV San Demetrio. And then we have the Wednesday videos about USS Marblehead and her refusal to die, the evolution of the carrier air wing in the Pacific in 1942, and a question or two from the FAQ that I did a little while back. The Count asks, what if the Spanish went through with their original plan to order six of the Palaio-type battleships? Would, and could, this have affected the Spanish-American War in a way that would have benefited Spain? And also, if the Spanish did acquire the originally planned six battleships, would this mean they would not have ordered the three Infanta Maria Teresa class cruisers? So, the second part first, yet they wouldn't have ordered the Infanta Maria Teresas because the funds that paid for those were diverted from the program to originally build more Palaios. So if they build more Palaios, the funds aren't available for anything else. Fairly logical. Now, if they did have six of them in service, well, a, a Palaio class is a lot more survivable than an Infanta Maria Teresa class. Um, a lot of things are considerably more survivable than an Infanta Maria Teresa class, including my Volvo. Yeah, them and the Orlandos, these are the, you know, the armoured cruisers of the 1880s, which are, here is our incredibly thin strip of waterline belt armour. You get extra points if you actually hit it, and everything else is just a fireball waiting to happen. In terms of would it have benefited Spain, well, the Spanish Navy, or the Armada, would have had considerably more capability to do damage to the US Navy. So theoretically, this is a benefit to Spain, albeit at the same time, if the US Navy does take substantial damage during the Spanish-American War, these Americans might impose further you know, reparations, etc. on the Spanish after the war to pay for it. So that might not work out for them too well in the end. But if they build six of them, it's going to depend a lot on where they're deployed. Because as we know from when it looked like Palaya was going to redeploy to the Philippines, there was some concern with the US Navy about whether or not Dewey's squadron would be able to stop it. So let's say they built six, and let's say they have three in the Caribbean, which, instead of the three in Santa Maria Teresa's, and let's say they send one to the Philippines, and they have two back in Spain, maybe one in service and one is refitting, ready to go out to relieve whichever ship out there has been out there the longest. Now, it's entirely possible the Spanish might keep most of, if not all of their battleships concentrated at home, because if there was one thing Palaio wasn't, it was long range. Um, so, you know, that range consideration might mean they're all just all back in Spanish waters anyway, but you never know, they might have staged them out there and then just gone, well, you're staying there till something breaks and then we'll bring you home, hopefully. So let's assume worst case scenario for the US, there's a battleship sitting in the Philippines and three in the Caribbean. Well, the one sitting in the Philippines, presumably with escorts, means that the US Navy is not going to try something immediately in Manila. They're going to want at least a battleship, if not more, of their own as reinforcements, which is probably wise. Now, when it comes to the Battle of Santiago de Cuba, that's going to be an interesting one, because on the one hand, hey, three pre-dreadnought battleships technically this is a good thing uh, for the Spanish. On the other hand, we are talking about three eight, mid-1880s design pre-dreadnoughts, and even the old USS Texas, the, which is traditionally the first American battleship, is four years newer design, albeit somewhat smaller than a Palio, and then you have the Indianas and the first Iowa BB-4, and those are all considerably newer. They have armoured turrets. This is a barbette vessel, so although it looks like it has a turret, that's actually just a, a fairly thin gun shield. But also the US ships, the Indianas and the Iowa, can bring a heavier broadside to bear because they have a uniform armament, 13 inch in the Indianas, 12 inch on the Iowas, of guns, and they are in two twin turrets, one four, one after, so they can bring a four gun broadside to bear. The Palaios are laid out French style. So they have a single main gun forward, a single main gun aft, and then two 
heavy guns on either wing, so they only have a maximum broadside of three guns, albeit three guns in all directions. And the thing that's really irritating is that those wing guns are in just over an inch and a half smaller than the guns at either end, so they don't have a uniform battery. They would either be shooting two small guns and one big gun fore or aft, or two big guns and one smaller gun on a broadside, which is really going to mess with your fire <laughs> control situations. Albeit, when you look at the Spanish-American War, it's not exactly like main gun hits were all that common anyway, to be fair. And given that Palayo, as the lead well, and in real life the historically only ship of her class, had only just been refitted with more modern quick-firing secondaries by the time the Spanish-American War started, chances are the rest of the ships probably wouldn't have been, so their secondary battery game will be pretty weak as well. So, although... In a hypothetical other battle of Santiago de Cuba, they probably will inflict more damage on the US ships simply because they can take more damage and they can dish out more damage than the Infanta Maria Teresa's. At the same time, I can't really see them coming off as the winners because they're older, they are going to be subject to probably more hits coming in from main and secondary batteries from the US ships than the US ships are going to receive in return, and they are more vulnerable because a hit on or near one of the main guns, or slightly secondary guns, is probably going to knock that gun out and kill everybody nearby because, you know, it's just a gun shield. Whereas a similar hit to one of the four, either the four or aft turret on one of the American battleships, yeah, it might knock the guns out if it's a direct hit, um, as in disabling them, but near misses are less likely to do anything, and even you know the secondary battery etc. hits on the main turrets probably won't do all that much. So the Palayos would lose combat effectiveness faster than their American counterparts, assuming a similar standard of gunnery. Now the only thing that might provide at least a temporary advantage is, as we know, the historical Battle of Santiago de Cuba. Um, the American ships were a little bit strung out trying to catch the Spanish ships because the Spanish ships made a concerted breakout. Um, in the event that that breakout is made up of three Palayos and friends, it's possible that the concentrated battery fire of three entire battleships, albeit not particularly brilliant ones, might bring down the leading US ships simply through sheer weight of fire, which might then lead to the US column being chewed up a little bit piecemeal. That's a somewhat optimistic assessment for the Spanish, but it theoretically could happen, given the way the historical battle went. Of course, the flip side is, if the Spanish have three full battleships in Santiago de Cuba instead of three armoured cruisers, the US Navy deployment might be slightly different as well. Josh Thomas Moore asks, If Renown and Repulse replaced Hie in the night battle of Guadalcanal, could they have made it out, and could they have done more damage? Yes, probably quite easily. For one thing, uh, obviously, Renown and Repulse don't have Type 3 uh, bombardment shells, so they would either be firing full-scope HE shells, or then, once they've gone through those AP shells, both of which are likely to do considerably more damage to the American ships they're hitting than the Type 3 bombardment rounds did. Plus, of course, uh, by this point, they both have radar, so they will almost certainly see the US ships coming a lot sooner, be ready to open fire a lot sooner. Um, being British ships, obviously, they also have night fighting training. Um, not the same as the Japanese, but you know, they have similar night fighting techniques and skills, just of a different sort. With Repulse, the the ship's not been modernised quite as much. It's still got a lot of the old triple four inch, but it has got some anti-aircraft guns it could put to use in against destroyers. But Renown especially, obviously, has all those brand new, lovely four point five inch anti-surface guns. So you know that would mess up quite a lot of incoming destroyers, as opposed to casement mounted secondaries and a variety of anti-aircraft weapons that the uh, HEA has to bear. Plus, of course, if it's Renown and Repulse, there's two of them as opposed to just the one HEA. Armor-wise, I mean, at that kind of close range you're fighting at, it's a pretty much a wash, albeit that, as I said, Renown and Repulse probably could engage further out anyway, um, and they're probably going to get the drop, which is going to help a lot more. So, yeah, broadly speaking, they're going to do considerably better than, than just HEA would. 
Grant Lee asks, when did sailing ships lose all of their crew? When I was looking at historical crew counts for even frigates like Constitution, the numbers of the crew are well above 300. However, when looking at ships like Carol A. Deering or the sailing ship Wyoming, crew counts to man a five or six masted sailing ship barely reach a dozen. Why is this? It's not so much that they lost crew, it's just that the ships of different uses didn't need so much crew. So Constitution is, of course, a frigate. She's a warship. And when you take into account that you're looking at between a dozen and 16 men for each gun crew, because you tend to have, you know, 10, tw uh, 12 to 16 men, depending on the ship, uh, per gun on one side, so that they can split and fire both sides if they need to, or they have casualty resilience if they're engaging on the one side, you then realize that even on a ship like Constitution, which has, you know, four to 450 crew um, on any given day, the vast majority of Constitution's crew are manning the guns. Ships like the Carol A. Deering and the Wyoming don't have guns, so they don't need those men. And then you have the Marine complement. Again, these are merchant vessels, so they don't need the Marine complement. So of the 450-odd crew that you might find on the Constitution, you've instantly wiped out 400 from your necessary list. So you're left with 50. Now, of those 50, you're going to have people manning the magazines. Don't need those. You're going to have officers to be in charge of all the various men, um, you know, all the various gun crews and etc. etc. Don't need them either. <laughs> um, and so all of a sudden you're down to just a core of a few dozen which are what are needed to set the sails and steer the ship and you know be in charge, carpenter, etc. etc. And that's for a ship that's going to be going for long distances for extended periods of time, uh, whereas a sailing merchant ship it might go for a long distance for an extended period of time, but they tend to be going point to point rather than just general patrolling. So most merchant sailing vessels tend to spend slightly less time at sea. Plus, of course, even within that remaining contingent for a ship like Constitution, you've got an allowance for casualties. You're not expecting casualties on a trade vessel, at, certainly at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. So you can eliminate the additional crew that uh, result from that. And now you're down to actually very close to the crew numbers that you find on one of these late, a, late sailing trade vessels. And then finally, you take into account the types of sails. You look at the number of sails locations, etc., etc., that you have on Constitution, and then take into account the number and type and size of sails on these trade vessels, plus the fact you have considerably more mechanical assistance in the latter part of the 19th and early 20th centuries, and suddenly you can man a very large sailing trade vessel like this with a dozen to two dozen men, as opposed to the hundreds of men you need for a warship. Adeline Lowry asks... In his letters to Churchill, Roosevelt heavily implied that once America was ready for war, it would join the war on Britain's side. If the Japanese had thought that war with America was avoidable or unnecessary, and thus allowed America to prepare for war and then declare war on both Germany and Japan at a time of its choosing, how would the Battle of the Atlantic and the Pacific War differ from what happened in reality? Well, the Battle of the Atlantic and the general European theatre campaigns would probably look relatively different because when you look at, say, the Arctic convoys, a lot of the US fast battleships before the Iowas actually did spend some time operating on the Arctic convoys. It was almost a shakedown area, if you like, for them before they headed over to the Pacific. Without the urgent need for fast battleships in the Pacific, I suspect that would have been, that would have occurred a lot more. Um, a lot more U.S. deployments on to the Arctic, um, perhaps some cruiser and destroyer deployments to the Mediterranean, but obviously the U.S. destroyer forces and the upcoming destroyer escorts would have cut their teeth on Battle of the Atlantic escort runs even more so than they did historically. U.S. aircraft carriers, I think, probably would have 
restricted themselves to distant support on the Arctic convoys, pretty much as USS Wasp, as you can see here, did in his history. But, um, you know, the Battle of the North Cape, with Scharnhorst happened in such poor weather you weren't going to fly aircraft anyway. So it generally becomes just a bit easier for the British and a lot harder for the uh, Kriegsmarine, especially in the Atlantic. And in the Mediterranean theatre, you might actually see some heavy cruisers on the Allied side, which would be a nice change. Now, of course, all of this depends on when exactly this declaration of war happens, because we start the timer on the 7th of December, 1941 and the ideal scenario for the allies is that the u.s declares war on germany in early 1942 hence all the stuff i just discussed but doesn't declare war on japan until let's say mid to late 1943 because at that point the italians are then out of the war prob um you know it's mostly landings and stuff that force them out of the war so probably around about the same uh tempo as you have historically and of course that then means that there's probably fewer losses because you know cruisers even Hermes the, the small carrier and destroyers and so forth that were lost for the Royal Navy in late 41 early 42 aren't lost in this scenario and for the US of course then you know ships like Yorktown and Hornet and Lexington are also, and Wasp for that matter, also not lost. Lots of their, well, the big five battleships, the Tennessees and the Colorados, will probably mostly either be in modernization or about to go in. And they'll have a lot more destroyers and cruisers floating around. Plus, of course, all their wartime production will be ramping up numbers. So then when war in the Pacific breaks out, ideally in our scenario, as a late 43, the British, now not having to worry so much about the Italians, because the Mediterranean's been kind of locked up, and presumably probably with the undivided attention of the USN helping them, probably also inflicting a few more casualties on the Germans in the interim, would be able to deploy a substantial portion of its forces east a lot sooner. And of course the US would be going in with its historical pre-war fleet, plus all the stuff they built in 42 and most of 43 so you'd have Essex's independences good chunk of escort carriers plus the pre-war carrier fleet of course the Japanese will have a few more cruisers that they've built a bunch more destroyers um, their ships like Taiho will be supplementing instead of replacing losses so the Japanese fleet will also be somewhat larger but the allied fleet will have had two and a bit years or roughly two years of constant combat operations working together, and the US obviously two years of combat operations, the British at that point three to four years. So in terms of battle experience, there'll be a little bit more experience than they were going in. Um, the only potential downside is, of course, that the Japanese capabilities will still be something of an unknown, albeit Allied radar efforts will be significantly more advanced. So it's possible you could still get things like First Savo happening except possibly on a grander scale, because there are now more ships in the theater for the Japanese to sink. But with a relatively substantial British task force coming in and a much larger than historical US Navy coming in, the Japanese might just get the decisive battle that they want because they might either A, feel that they can, or they might feel that they have to, because if they know that there's a you know relatively large British task force coming in via the Mediterranean across the Indian Ocean, and there's a big US task force coming in from Pearl Harbor, they might think we have to go and kill one of these first before, because we can't fight both of them combined, and then whichever side they choose to pick on, you get your big decisive battle. I mean, that's one way it could go. There's a lot of other ways it could go as well, but that's just one hypothetical. Emperor Dave 3006 asks, why was the Yamato class so much heavier than the number 13s? They have a similar main armament, 8 versus 9 18 inch guns. The armor is similar at 13 versus 16 inch, and number 13 is actually two knots faster using older machinery, which should make it therefore heavier than the Yamatos. But then why is Yamato 22 and a half thousand tons heavier? Are the secondaries and the three inches of armor that much more impactful? 
Well, there are a few major differences. For one thing, the Yamatos have a much greater beam. Their beam is almost 128 feet. The projected beam for the number 13s was 101 um, and a fraction. So you're talking about 27 feet wider. And whilst the number 13s are just a fraction longer, and you know, nine about 40 foot longer, the fact is that if you make a ship wider, that substantially increases its surface area considerably more than a similar extension forward or aft. And of course, the bow and the stern narrow quite a bit as well. So there's significantly more volume to the Yamatos, which is going to displace a lot. And as we've discussed before, when you do deck armor, deck armor per inch thickness takes up an awful lot more weight there than belt armor would because the belt armor, even though you've got belt armor on both sides, actually covers a significantly smaller area than the deck does. And particularly with Yamato being so wide, that extra beam really means that any significant thickness of deck armor for a Yamato class is going to weigh an absolute ton. So and the number 13 is projected to have uh, five inches of deck armor, whereas the deck armor for the Yamato is majority eight inches and some of it is nine inches. So even just using the eight inches, let alone the extra inch that's over about 25% of the deck armor, Yamato is carrying about 6,000 plus tons of additional deck armor just because of its dimensions. Even if we assumed that the Citadel was the same percentage length of, of length, thanks to that extra beam and the extra thickness. And it's going to be more than that because of the nine inch thickness. But so let's say 7,000 tons of additional deck armor and that extra three inches of armor on the belt, that's about two thirds of a ton per square meter. And there's a fair amount of square meterage on there. So well over half the difference in displacement between a number 13 and Yamato is going to be taken up purely just by the weight of the additional belt armor and the additional and more expansive deck armor. And that's assuming that the armor schemes occupy a similar percentage of the overall ship's area. Yamato actually had a slightly more extensive scheme, but you know that's just the main belt thickness in the deck. And we're already more than halfway towards the displacement of Yamato. Then you take into account the truly absurd amount of weight on the triple 18 inch turrets of Yamato, the substantially larger superstructure, the fact that its secondary battery initially comes in its own turrets with its own barbettes, so that's going to add a bunch more weight as well, as opposed to what the number 13s were going to use, which of course would have been casemates. Then you've got the extensive aircraft handling facilities on Yamato and the substantially increased torpedo protection on Yamato. And all of a sudden you can understand why the displacement has ballooned to such a great degree. And actually they're sort of carrying roughly the same amount of power, which obviously on the much greater displacement of Yamato means it goes slightly slower. Brendan Boersdorf asks, do you think it's possible to save HMAS Cerberus or is she doomed to rust away? Now, I think I've answered this relatively recently before, but I have a feeling it was possibly on the post Australia, Australia live stream. So I'll answer it here again in brief. A good chunk of HMAS Cerberus has already rusted away, unfortunately, as you can see from this overhead shot I took while I was in Australia earlier this year. Um, her superstructure is basically entirely gone. You've just got the breastwork, the turrets and the hull. The guns have already been taken out. You can see looking down into the turrets, the tur guns themselves are actually on the seabed just a little bit. What would be in this picture, I think, uh, to the a little bit just beyond the bottom of the picture if I've got my orientation right. But even with the guns gone, some portions of the lower hull, as far as I understand it, have already uh, started to collapse, and apparently the deck is no longer safe for people to go on. So whilst normally I would say with enough money anything's possible, I don't think her hull is in a state where trying to relocate her would actually work. I think she would probably collapse if you did try to move her, which is a pity. However, there is theoretically a method by which she could be preserved. I mean, it would be expensive, but then again, it wouldn't necessarily be the most expensive ship preservation scheme ever undertaken either. So what I think you'd need to do is 
is that again not what's not in this shot is that she's not actually that far from land and there is a pier that runs out about halfway from the shore to where she is i think what you need to do is to build a coffer dam and a fairly substantially sized one around her so not in terms of overall area but in terms of height and then once you've got the coffer dam in place, and I don't know exactly what the seabed conditions are, but they don't, it looks fairly sandy to me, but not maybe not the sand isn't too deep, I think, from <laughs> looking at everything. Once all of that is in place, you would then have to drain the interior carefully. But once you've got an inert, still environment, send down divers, take a precise estimate of what condition the ship is in, because draining the water might cause the ship to collapse under its own weight. Put in reinforcements as needed and then carefully drain things away. And you might do that, even do that in stages. Um, and then once the area is drained, you could, if you wanted to, um, cap it to stop you know waves coming over the top and also to provide a hermetically sealed environment. And then you could start preserving it by stabilizing the atmosphere, giving it treatments, etc., etc., and just extend that pier out to a little airlock um, in the side of the coffer dam. And then once you want to let visitors in, you could maybe make that double layered, have a walking balcony or something on the inside that maybe spirals down and then goes back up again so people can look at it, but probably wise not to actually get onto it. And you could retrieve the guns as well and put them in. So yeah, it would be possible to do. Um, it wouldn't be eye-wateringly, mind-breakingly expensive, but it would involve a fair amount of commitment and effort and a fair amount of engineering skill as well. Services are available, Australian government, if you would like me to draw up a design for you. BK Zhang asks, if 4Z had survived and joined ABDA command, is it possible that the Kido Butai would have played a larger role in the Dutch East Indies campaign hunting down the British capital ships or even that Yamato, which was already complete under past sea trials by the time of Pearl Harbor and commissioned on December 16th, would have been sent to the Dutch East Indies to counter Prince of Wales. I don't think they would have sent Yamato because they were retaining Yamato and, well, once she completed Musashi and even to a great extent uh, Nagato and Mutsu for what they thought was going to be the decisive battle with the US ships. Now, they did commit the Congos to the Dutch East Indies campaign in any case, and whilst obviously Congo versus Prince of Wales is somewhat one-sided in Prince of Wales' favour, if 4Z survives, so you're talking about Prince of Wales and Repulse, um, you know, a Congo is on paper near as much as makes no difference, roughly equivalent to Repulse, which would mean you now have three Congos <laughs> to go after Prince of Wales, or more likely two on two and two on two. Um, now, Repulse is not really going to survive a battle with two Congos for very long. Prince of Wales against two Congos might well be able to put one of the Congos down relatively quickly, so they would need help from the other Congos in short order. So you never know, the Japanese might go for 3v1 and 1v1. And yet, yeah, 3v1 Congos versus Prince of Wales? Sorry, but, you know, while the Congos are a little bit fragile, three of them versus Prince of Wales is is a bit of a, a walkover, realistically speaking. Um, Prince of Wales is not going to survive that. Now, because of the speed of uh, Forsaid, sending Nagato and Mutsu is not probably not going to work out, because if you've got Nagato, Mutsu, and the Congos, if they stick to the speed of the Nagatos, uh, then Prince of Wales and Repulse can refuse the engagement. But then to, to a certain extent, the same is almost true of the Yamato, because although Yamato is only very, very fractionally slower than Prince of Wales, if Prince of Wales and Repulse see Yamato coming over the horizon with the Congos, they can just sail away and the distance isn't really going to close unless the Congos detach and try and slow down Prince of Wales and Repulse by damaging their propulsion or causing extensive flooding. Um, but the other fact is, you know, if Forsaid does survive, it's probably going to be reinforced somewhat by the time of the Dutch East Indies campaign. But, you know, leaving that aside, I think the Japanese probably would 
stick the, some of the heavy cruisers, again, which they committed to the Dutch East Indies campaign anyway, they'd probably stick a, a full class of heavy cruiser with the four Congos. And that's, I mean, yeah, they'll take a bit of a battering maybe, but that's enough force to overcome for Z. Um, and if you have the whole of ABDA command, that sort of wonderfully heterogeneous unit sailing with it, well, the Japanese commit the ships that they historically did. Perhaps more likely is the Kido Batai, because obviously the carriers, historically, they did some carrier aircraft were used to go after some ships. But if they know they've got two enemy capital ships in the vicinity, then yeah, I can see, you know, at least a carrier division, if not more of the Kido Batai being sent to soften up or kill, or try and kill at least, for said especially in combination with the Congos, because whilst the Japanese might not want to write off a Congo or two taking out for said, if they've got a carrier division that can swarm, damage, cripple, and occupy the Repulse and Prince of Wales whilst the Congos close in, then maybe they'll get away with it, uh, or at least maybe they'll only lose the one Congo. J.R. Turner asks... Seeing the casement guns on Marblehead and the date of her completion, I realise I have the sense that Dreadnought started a line of development that would eventually see casement guns go away, but no clear idea on the exact timing and scale. What and when was the first major ship design, cruisers, battleships, etc., without casements, and when were the majority of new designs no longer incorporating casements, and what was the last design to feature casement guns? When it comes to cruisers, Omaha is a bit of a throwback because there are lots of cruiser designs that go way back before Omaha that don't have casements. Now, granted, the vast majority of those are protected cruisers, and so you know by default they can't really have casements because of the definition of a casement, amongst other things, that it is, has an armoured gun shield and is embedded in the hull, and most protected cruisers, well, by definition, do not have armor above the turtle back deck and if they have any gun shields at all well the guns are usually open mounted although if you want to look at armored cruisers then you're probably looking at something like the warrior class in 1903 where the secondaries moved to turrets albeit that's partially because the secondaries moved up to being 7.5 inch guns and trying to make a 7.5 inch secondary in a casement is going to be an interesting exercise by the second half of the 1900s, i.e. 1905 to 1910, what armoured cruiser designs were still being built? So Georges Averoff, the Pisa class, Blücher for that matter, had all also abandoned casements as their secondary battery gun layout. On battleships, it's actually a slightly weird one in that you do have some relatively early turret-mounted secondaries. Obviously, you have some of the US pre-dreadnoughts have 8-inch guns in secondary turrets, but then they have tertiary batteries and so forth. Then you've got Dante Alighieri, I think it is, the first Italian dreadnought, which has a partial turret-mounted secondary battery, although some of its secondaries are also still in casements. But if you want a design as opposed to a ship that was actually built, the first designs with full turreted secondaries, at least designs that got you know fully specced out and ready to be built, are actually the G3 and N3 class battlecruisers and battleships, respectively, of the Royal Navy at the beginning of the 1920s. Everything else, you know, the L20E Alphas, the Tosas, the Amagis for that matter, uh, the Lexingtons, the South Dakota 1920 designs, they all have some form of casement battery, albeit on the American ships. They've moved their guns up above the level of the hull, which they'd done earlier on in the standard class. But the G3s and N3s have actual turreted secondaries, twin six-inch guns to be precise. And then in terms of actual design implemented, the Nelson class, which are obviously the diminutives of of mostly the G3s, to be honest, are then the first battleships to have an entirely turreted secondary gun armament. And when you look at cruisers during the World War I period, so C, D, E class, Hawkins class, Karlsruhe's, uh, Kolns, etc. for the Germans, and so on and so forth, by the 1910s, pretty much no cruiser is being designed with a casement. It's all either open mounts or shielded mounts. 
hence why I say with the Omaha's, it's a little bit of a throwback trying to get as many guns into a relatively small hull for that number of guns as possible. The Omaha's are not small by the standards of cruisers of the early 1920s, but they are carrying a very heavy armament. And of course, with battleships, thanks to the battleship design and build holiday that's imposed by the Washington Naval Treaty, by the time everybody picks up battleship designs in the late 1920s, thinking that they'll have to build in the early 1930s, and then subsequently actually builds battleships in the mid-1930s onwards, obviously by that point everyone's gone over to no casement, fully turreted secondaries. Declan Bennett asks, I have a question regarding the assignment of fighters to various early US carriers. In Lundstrom's The First Team, from Pearl Harbor to Midway, in the days running up to the outbreak of the war, he lists USS Lexington carrying 21 F2A3 Brewster Buffaloes as her fighter complement, Saratoga carrying 13 F4 F3 Wildcats and 14 Buffaloes, and Enterprise carrying 13 F4 F3A Wildcats, the inferior stopgap Wildcat variant according to the pilots and official designers, or at least as far as I've seen. It just seems strange that the Lexington glass at the start of the war had one carrying the worst US carrier fighter, the other carrying both the worst and the best, and the Yorktown class in Enterprise seemingly carrying a middle ground. What was the reasoning behind what, which particular carrier or carrier class received what type of fighters? There wasn't any particular reasoning at the time as to which air carriers got which aircraft in terms of people saying, well, you know, this is our latest ship, so it should get the latest fighters, or this is our biggest ship, so it should get the latest fighters, or anything like that. It was simply a case of when those fighters became available. So, for example, the F2A3, that had only been ordered in January of the same year, January 1941. So, <laughs> you know, they've got to then build the aircraft. The aircraft have to be accepted into US service, and then the pilots who are going to fly those aircraft have to be trained in using that aircraft. Now, admittedly, with the Buffalo, that's going to be slightly easier because there's previous versions of the Buffalo which pilots would have been experienced with. So a transition over to the newer features of the F2A3 would have taken a relatively short amount of time. But you've also got to build enough aircraft for it to be worthwhile. So, you know, if you order, let's say, and I'm just going to use arbitrary numbers here. Um, so if you order the F2A3 Buffalo in January 1941, let's say the first aircraft rolls out of the factory in June. So if the f aircraft comes out of the factory in June, that's great. You now have your first fighter, but you're not going to deploy a single fighter to an aircraft carrier or even to a training squadron. Because, of course, you know, training accidents happen. So you might deliver it to the training squadron the next day it gets written off. So you need at least above squadron strength. So you've got to wait for that factory to produce, you know, 16, 20 aircraft. You'll be accepting them to the airfield and looking them over. But you're not really going to start training with them until you have a squadron plus some spares really get ready to go. And then, of course, once you've done that, you've got to go through this testing trial process and then once your air group your fighter group has is happy that you know we can fly these aircraft competently you then have to wait for a carrier to actually be available because at the time there are multiple u.s navy aircraft training centers some on the east coast and uh, one or two on the west coast and so if let's say a particular fighter squadron is ready to be deployed on a carrier and it's all trained up with buffaloes but that carrier is currently out in the middle of the Pacific on an exercise or on a deployment. Well, you can't deploy to it. You have to wait till the carrier comes back in and the air group on board is eligible to be rotated out. And then you can swap that lot in. And the same with the Wildcat. And the Wildcat is a slightly harder task because although the F4, F3 is ordered a little bit sooner than the F2A3, the F4, F3 is the first major Wildcat variant to enter US service, so there's not the, you know, several months to a couple of years of experience of flying similar aircraft the way there was with the F2A3. And then you mix that up with the fact that towards the latter part of 1941, the US Navy is becoming very, very, very conscious of the fact that war is approaching very rapidly, and suddenly it's a case of, well, we have a roughly squadron-sized unit of 
new fighters that can be deployed. Okay, so these guys are going out with the next carrier that comes in. So if you know, if Lexington comes in and they have a couple of squadrons worth of buffaloes, well, Lexington gets those. Now, now you have to train up a new lot of pilots, whether that be pilots that have just come off of Lexington or other pilots that have come up through training or pilots that have come in off other carriers and are waiting for new aircraft. So then, you know, Saratoga, let's say, okay, Saratoga's coming in. She needs a new air group. Well, we don't have two squadrons of buffaloes. We've got a squadron of buffaloes over here because that's what's come out of the factory. And we've got a squadron of wildcats over here because that's what's come out of the Grumman factories. Well, together, that's roughly two squadrons worth of aircraft, right? you get out there now at least we've got vaguely modern fighters on two carriers enterprise okay well what have we got there for enterprise well in the interim by the time enterprise has come back in we've got another squadron's worth of wildcats ready to go right okay well guess what they're going out there um it's it's a very much more fraught situation as compared to obviously peacetime where they can wait until they've built up enough fighters to redeploy an entire um vmf unit or a vf unit and obviously later on in the war, once production had got really up and going, they would have more than enough aircraft to have you know, single types of fighters aboard aircraft carriers if that's what they wanted to do. So, yeah, it's just a case of what aircraft were available and what pilots were trained on what aircraft when those carriers came in and needed new fighters. And it can even come down to the fact that, you know, let's say a carrier comes in on the West Coast. Well, if the West Coast airfields have been training buffalo pilots well that carrier gets buffaloes there may well be a squadron that can fly wildcats over on the east coast but if the carrier isn't going to the east coast well that squadron is going to wait till the carrier does come in into an east coast port or somewhere close enough that they can ferry run to it my mum's basement needs more windows asks can you tell us briefly about right-handed twist rope versus left-handed twist the possible uses for a rope that was twisted one way at one end and the other way at the other end and the practicality of the manufacture of such rope without tying two separate ropes together well i'll preface this by saying i am by no means an expert in ropes but as far as i'm aware i don't think you can manufacture a rope that is twisted with a left hand twist in at one end and a right hand twist at the other end because at some point they're going to have to cross over and when they cross over the strands are going to be sep uh, separated not twisted together at which point i would suspect the rope would just come apart event quite quickly at, at that point uh, along the rope unless you knotted it or something like that but you know i can't really see much point to that the main thing with left and right handed twists is that they tend to coil in opposite directions because obviously there is an underlying tension in that rope. There is some benefit to that. Now, if you're talking about lines that people are going to be throwing, generally speaking, you're going to want almost all of those to be right handed because everybody, well, not everybody, but almost everybody is right handed. I'm left handed, but I'm in a very, very small minority. And if you, as a left-hander, swing a right-handed twist rope around your head, you can actually run the risk of uncoiling it, whereas uh, the, the reverse is not, not true. So a right-handed hand, right -handed sailor, you know, twirling a right-handed rope around, twisted rope around his head to throw it, you're not going to run the risk of uncoiling that rope. But when you get to the bigger lines, so especially things like anchor cables where you have anchors going off the left hand side and right hand side of the ship and you think about you know look at the capstans before they go over to chains but you look at the capstans on ships where you have anchors on both sides obviously you usually see the capstans will turn in opposite directions um it, you do sometimes have ships where all the capstans will turn one way or the other um usually when the capstan on the center line but if you have two separate capstans um, you usually have kind of a mirror image thing going on. And in that case, you would probably want left-handed rope for your left left anchor and your right-handed ropes for your right anchors and situations like that. And to a certain extent, possibly even with certain amounts of rigging, although, again, I'm not so sure about the rigging. The alternative is, of course, you can do a braided rope, which you can see there on the right, which doesn't have a left or right-hand bias and therefore is more usable in any situation.
Vauquier asks, why do US fast battleships have their secondary turrets in a W configuration instead of an M configuration? I would have figured the additional weight, stability, and space consuming concerns would be significant. Well, here's the layout on USS Massachusetts. Now, I suspect that there are a couple of reasons. I haven't been able to pin this down precisely, uh, although I found various indications in various books. But I think it's a combination of two things. Firstly, if you saw the North Carolina class design video, the initial design of the US fast battleship secondary battery, the design that actually would make a good, substantial way through the final design process was not five twins like this. You had two twins in the positions you can see on the lower element of the ship. You then had what is now the central twin on the upper position, and then you had two singles, one at each end. Weight-wise, then stability-wise, etc., that makes a lot of sense. And then late in the design process, it was upgraded to everything being twin mountings. So there's a certain amount of just design inertia. It's much easier to go, okay, swap these two singles out for two twins than it is to go, okay, well, we're swapping the two singles out for two twins, but also we're completely redeploying where the magazines and the hoists and the mountings are all going to be. The other factor, which I've come across a few references to as well, is in terms of fields of fire, because, I mean, you can see kind of hit, this is obviously being a South Dakota class, but if you look at uh, the North Carolina, US, or even, well, pictures of the Iowa, because the Iowas these days don't have their aft two mounts on either side, you can kind of see that it, the lower mountings are on the same deck level as uh, some of the main battery gun turrets which would mean there'd be certain restrictions in their ability to fire at very close angles fore and aft, especially if the turrets are rotated anything other than fore and aft. So you can imagine, even just looking at this photo, if the uh, forwardmost of the lower two uh, five-inch mounts is trying to fire at a very close angle forward, either at a destroyer or at an aircraft that's coming in at fairly close range, if the 16-inch turrets are rotated to fire to starboard, in this case, these uh, lower mounts can't do that because they'd be firing into the side of their own main battery turrets. Whereas that upper mount, okay, it can't fire absolutely dead level necessarily, but it can fire at a much shallower angle over a rotated main battery turret <laughs> than the lower mounts can. And you know, general field of fire. So I suspect it's a it's a combination of well, this is the design we've already come up with for the mixture of singles and twins, and it's just easier to upgrade it rather than completely alter it. Combined with the fact that those upper mountings have significantly better arcs of fire, so it's better to have six guns with better arcs of fire and four guns with slightly lesser arcs of fire than the other way around. But I am quite happy if anyone has managed to uncover a precise reasoning beyond that to hear about it in the comments below. Y Yokosuka Girls Marine High School training vessel Harakaze asks, especially during the age of sail and into the early period of radio communication aboard ships, navies of various nations battled each other despite there being a treaty just signed. What are some interesting events where ships have come into ports to declare they sank an enemy only to be told they're at peace and the crew has to make some rather interesting arrangements. In terms of purely naval engagements, you have ships like uh, CSS Shenandoah, Confederate Merchant Raider, which thanks to the lag in international communications and then further still the lag in what physical paper documents were carried by ships at sea, because obviously they would update them when they were last in port, got some indication that maybe the war in the US was over, i.e. the American Civil War was over about a month after that occurred, but it was ambiguous and so they continued fighting. And so they basically fought through the entire summer raiding merchant ships, etc. after the American Civil War had officially come to an end. And then they were actually on their way to attack San Francisco. So San Francisco could have come under the guns of a Confederate raider months after the war was actually over, only to then receive definitive proof that 
the war was over, at which point they realized, yeah, we're a bunch we're of merchant raiding sailors anyway, which the Union wasn't particularly happy with compared to some other elements of the Confederate military. And we've been attacking Union ships for months and months after the war ended. I don't think they're going to like us very much. And as a result, Shenandoah did a quick about face and instead of attacking the US West Coast, actually worked her way all the way around to the UK and surrendered to the Royal Navy in Liverpool, uh, which they thought was the best way of keeping themselves out of Union hands because they were worried they might be hung as pirates. And at the end of the War of 1812, well, the Treaty of Ghent had actually been signed in late 1814. It was ratified even in early 1815, which means there are actually three separate naval battles that occur after the treaty is signed and two of them after the treaty is ratified at the end of the War of 1812. So the capture of USS President by Endymion and friends occurs in January 1815, which is partway between the signing of the treaty and the final ratification of the treaty. Then in February 1815, you have the ratification of the treaty on the 17th, but three days later, you have USS Constitution um, capturing HMAS, HMS Cyan and Levant in its final action of the war. So that's three days after the treaty has been ratified. And then in June, you have the USS Peacock, which manages to capture the East India Company brig Nautilus. And that's you know months after the war is over. In fact, uh, Pe uh, the Nautilus's crew know that the war is over, um, but Peacock doesn't, hence the, the capturing. And sort of an interesting subsidiary to that is not only do you have three naval battles, um, you know, two of which are after the ratification, one is just after the signing. But when Constitution captures Cyan and Levant, Levant is then recaptured by the British in March, um, presumably because that British squadron also doesn't know that the war is over. But whilst a little bit embarrassing, it was generally held in these times by everybody that, yeah, communications aren't the best, and as long as the battle was engaged in in good faith, i.e. the people who opened the battle had no idea that the war was actually over, then they pretty much just wrote it off as it just happens to be fortunes of war. Trevor Polasek asks, who do you think is the most underrated admiral of World War II that historians should talk about more? Well, Admiral Helfrich certainly has to be on that list. You know, <laughs> the fact that when I was doing the video on the Dutch submarine campaign, it was incredibly difficult to find any substantial information purely about Admiral Helfrich written in a book or article about him rather than just in association. Uh, pretty much the only go-to source of detail of what he was thinking is going to his memoirs, which are mostly, um, in most editions, still in Dutch. But once you get beyond that, th there are quite a lot of different admirals because I mean obviously admirals like Halsey and Nimitz get a lot written about them Cunningham as well and obviously rightfully so in all three cases Yamamoto as well gets a lot written about him same with Dernitz and Raider but a lot of the time you will find other admirals who did some fairly important and or interesting things and again you find very little about them other than their general career records uh I mean, it's a little bit of a what if because he was essentially taken out of seagoing commands, but something a bit more about, say, Admiral Marshall, the German admiral who was in charge of the Scharnhorsts when they took on HMS Glorious. That would be quite interesting because he was a very aggressive German admiral, which is relatively rare for German battleship commanders and battleship admirals in World War II. ACC asks... This month, uh, Rex's Hanger released this video, gives a link, um, in which he describes the United States top secret video guided remote operated aerial combat bomber drones. Yeah, that was actually a really interesting video. I know the US used remote guided drones to practice and develop the anti aircraft doctrine in the interwar period, and I've heard the Germans used wired drones for the same purpose. Did any other Navy use any form of remote drone as a target in the interwar period? And did any other Navy conceive of or use a similar style of proto-predator drone with the amazingly limited audiovisual technology of that era? 
Yes, there were various attempts, some less successful than others, at introducing remote control aircraft for target practice. Now, obviously, target tugs were much easier to do. I just have an aircraft towing along a target for people to shoot at. But the, uh, let's say, questionable accuracy of interwar anti-aircraft batteries meant that even a target tug flying as a uh, a target for a single vessel was a little bit hazardous. And if you were going to fly over a fleet or even a flotilla that was going to be shooting at you, the rather scattered nature of incoming anti-aircraft fire made a target tug a rather dangerous prospect. And so people would investigate and put into service various remote control targets. So this, as you can see here, uh, well, it's Winston Churchill on the left, and on the right is the Queen Bee, which is a British remote control variant of the Tiger Moth biplane, which was used as a remote control aerial target for anti-aircraft practice, and did good solid service in the interwar period, albeit uh, on occasion before proper high angle control systems were introduced, and even when some of the very early prototypes were introduced, the accuracy was such that on one famous occasion, a Queen Bee was flown over, a, I think it was the entire Mediterranean fleet, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and furious anti-aircraft fire erupted, but the aircraft sailed on perfectly unharmed, to the point that because there were some uh, celebrity guests watching, the uh, sailor who was in charge of actually remotely controlling the thing was told okay bring it back around for another pass and when we do when the you see a burst that might be something close to you know vaguely in the general vicinity of the aircraft just put the thing into a, a diving spin so it looks like it's been shot down <laughs> um, but yeah there, there were other remote control target aircraft used for anti-aircraft gunnery in various navies the queen bee being one of them and in terms of airborne, effectively cruise missiles in the early, inter well, in the interwar and early World War II era, again, they weren't an unknown thing. The US, and to a limited extent the UK, but mostly the US, as far as I can see, even started looking at these kinds of things towards the end of World War One, albeit none of them entered full service like the one that Rex's hangar mentioned. Uh, but this particular one here, this is called the Larynx. Um, and yes, that is gen genuinely what it was called. This is a Royal Navy attempt in the interwar period to build a essentially propeller-driven cruise missile, which after a few tests actually kind of worked. Um, this is mounted on a destroyer, obviously. And there was some debate as to whether or not you use this thing as essentially yeah, a guided bomb that could be launched off of a ship to attack a fixed target on land, like most cruise missiles are today. But there was also some talk about converting it into a radio-controlled unit, which could then be used as a, an early anti-shipping missile, which as you know, would give something like a destroyer, which could launch such a thing, potentially a punch against capital ships at longer ranges as opposed to you know previously destroyers had had torpedoes they still did have torpedoes but gun ranges had generally outdistanced torpedoes so there was some thought of maybe this would give the destroyer back a kind of equal range heavy hitting capability but the program didn't really go anywhere beyond a few tests and rounding off this week with a little bit of a fun question Alec Ruby asks, which navies in World War II would have pleased each of the Chaos Gods the most? That's a Warhammer 40k reference for those of you who don't follow that particular law. Well, to be honest, I, I'd be hard-pressed to pin down specific navies, but I could pin down specific sections. So, for example, if you want to please Corn the Blood God, you know, blood for the Blood God, skulls for the Throne of Corn, insane aggressiveness and vicious close combat potential that's pretty much going to go to most navies destroyer commanders <laughs> um yeah that they're, they're, they're a special little breed of attack dogs for slanesh uh god or potentially goddess of the various types of excess and pleasure well i think that has to be just a general award to almost any bunch of sailors who have been cooped up in their ships for far too long who've been given liberty in a port that uh shall we say, has considerable numbers of houses of easy virtue. For Zinch, god of plans, 
and change and generally contradicting oneself and then things going all sorts of haywire. That's probably actually one of the few where you could maybe give one navy above others the distinction. And for that, I would probably give it to the Japanese navy with their incredibly convoluted campaign plans and can the Kanta Kessen doctrine overall, which called for so many interlocking bits to go right, and then in a truly Zinchian manner, usually didn't. And as far as Nurgle, disease, plague, etc., etc., um, well, I suppose there's there's two ways of looking at it. First would be, you know, a second honorary award for all the sailors who were devotees of Slaanesh a moment earlier when they get back to the ship and have to go through their VD checks. Alternatively, alternatively, you could probably look at maybe some of the earlier Royal Navy ships, which had not been designed with great crew comforts in mind generally, and where they did have crew comforts retrofitted, they were generally heating systems to keep them warm in the waters of the North Sea, etc. And then these ships designed to you know keep heat in and heat up quite nicely, and then put out into the Pacific where they're turned into sweltering hot boxes. That's not really good for people's health. And with that question, which was a bit of an unexpected one, I must admit, out of the left field, we're going to wrap up this episode of The Dry Dock. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. Hopefully at the time that you're listening to this, if you're listening to it a day early because of the Patreon early release, I will be somewhere over the Atlantic on my way to Seattle. And for those of you who are regular listening to it on the regular day of release, uh, that being hopefully, if all things go well, the 10th of September 2023, I will be in the United States itself in Seattle looking at a rather wonderful museum. So thanks for listening and see you again in another video or potentially in person in the next couple of weeks. Bye.